Might the colleague I have asked to turn off the gallery lights please do so at this time. The very first thing I did 11 and a half hours ago when I arrived at the museum today was to come to this gallery to look yet again at our newly acquired painting by Luca Giordano, The Liberation of St. Peter. And this is essentially how I experienced it. As our eyes are somewhat adjusting to the darkness, I ask you, what is it that we see? And I'm the first to admit very little. But the brightest section of the artist's composition is the center, very comparably to the Rubens that Brian mentioned, gleaming in the center, the Christ child. And what was, and what has the artist painted in that area? The angel and the aura of light around him. What we're experiencing is how a 17th century viewer in Naples, probably in a church setting, often would have experienced how he or she would have experienced the painting as well. Now, to be sure, at times there would have been daylight and, of course, candle illumination. Yet this rather atypical exercise I'm bold enough to undertake with you all, I hope has provided insight into how we are to interpret the significance of the artist's conscious creative decision with respect to light. Our attention is purposely directed at the role of the divine in the narrative he depicted. May we have the gallery lights back on, please. <clears throat> the textual source for the narrative depicted is told in the book of Acts, chapter 12, and Bishop Thomas shall be reading that to us later. I'll be paraphrasing it for you as I help you look at this picture. And I've just spoken about light. <clears throat> in the upper right of the picture, there's a lantern, but there's no light coming from it. The source of light within this painting, in a narrative described as happening at night, instead is the, as the Bible has it, light that shined in the prison. Uh, the radiance emanating from the resplendent and divine messenger. There are ten figures in this composition, four at right, two in the center, uh, and uh, four at, so four at left, two in the center, and four at right. And their identities are, six of them are guards, five asleep, one in the process of being put to sleep. <clears throat> Two fellow prisoners in the upper right, chained and oblivious to what's going on, just as the guards are, and then the central figures, the angel and Peter. So that's the identity of the figures, but let's look at it formally, how the artist created his composition as well. There's a triangular group in the lower right, as there is in the lower center. There's a vertical in the center, that leg of the angel levitating right there with a cast shadow near it. And there's a diagonal, not only of the other leg of the angel, but also of St. Peter fleeing. And if you attempt to stand as canted as his fake form is, you'll see that the implication is a figure running and moving. And as I've stressed, the centrality of those figures certainly is giving primacy to them within the narrative. The angel has wings. Courbet, that great 19th century artist, the realist, said, show me an angel and I'll paint one. Uh, Mr. Giordano was willing to uh, depict the unseeable for his audiences. So there's cast shadow, there's wings, there's levitation, there's an upright angel. So they, all of this together is telling us of the supernatural and the divine and also of certainty and formality and solidity. Think of the columns on the front of this very museum. Peter, on the other hand, is earthbound. He's leaning forward, as I said. He's the mortal. 
in this confrontation of spiritual and mortal. The next passage uh, that after this exact narrative that Bishop Thomas will read goes on to say, and he, Peter, went out and followed, and followed him, meaning the angel, and Peter wist not that it was true what the angel had done, meaning set him free. And so uh, Peter here is bewildered but obedient. I had an undergraduate professor, a man named Frank Robinson, who spoke in class of, of repeatedly of the language of hands. Look at the hands in this painting, as well as the other 16 paintings in this uh, room. In fact, every other painting in this room, except perhaps this portrait, the hands are vital to understanding the narrative that the painters are depicting. The angel's hand is directing Peter, but it's also putting to sleep the guard in the upper left. Peter's hands in front of him are reflective of obedience and perhaps even reference and not inconceivably even suggesting a cross, not dissimilar from the way two pieces of wood in the upper left of the Murillo Adoration of the Kings that I'm pointing at to your right uh, may well allude to as well. The guard's hands in the foreground, let's take a look at the one at right, slumber to be sure. So hands are very important. Perhaps the best example in the entire museum is a gallery or two away, um, El Greco's uh, The Agony in the Garden, where Christ kneeling at the angel appearing to him holding the cup has hands at different levels. The equivocation as he's struggling, the word agony actually meaning struggle. So within the Luca Giordano, I submit to you all, there's a juxtaposition of two manners, realism and idealism. A rugged realism in the foreground of those soldiers, muscular physiques, armor, weapons, garments, yet they're impotent in any ability to act. And then the angel, perhaps redolent of a painting Luca Giordano would have seen in the Vatican, and in, in, in a room that Raphael painted of this very subject. There's a, therefore a dichotomy of two styles. Giordano's rugged naturalism or realism and the ideal. And this is then suggesting the duality of the mortal and the spiritual. The artist of the evening, Luca Giordano, was born in Naples in 1634. His father was a painter with whom he presumably initially studied, uh, and the father was also an art dealer. But the artist, Luca Giordano, then apprenticed in his native city with a Spaniard who was in Naples at the time, Naples being a Spanish territory at that moment in history, an artist named Giuseppe Ribera. And from this podium, if I take one step, two steps to my side, I'm looking at the Toledo Museum of Art's portrait of a musician to your right hanging in there by Luca Giordano. If you can't see it presently, take this merely as an enticement to go look at it subsequently. <clears throat> and this contact with Giordano was his uh, approach and, and experience of learning how to render uh, tactile naturalism, his convincing realism, take a look at the feet of the soldier in the foreground right. He doesn't have his sandals on. Those are dirty feet, people. We need to look closely and actually understand that the artist was looking very closely. An artist in the background even of Ribera, um, Caravaggio painted a picture on commission uh, of the death of the Virgin. And it was rejected by the church uh, due to how uh, unsacred virgin was rendered with dirt on her fingers and, and to under her toenails. So I'm, I'm stressing the, the realism so as to allow the, an understanding of how this picture in its 17th century context would have still uh, been understood and, and perhaps comparably to how we do today. Giordano was well traveled within Italy um, from his teenage years on. He looked, he'd been in Rome, Florence, Venice. He looked at the artists Raphael, I've alluded to, Titian, Veronese. We have a picture by Veronese uh, in one of our galleries nearby. Tintoretto, he knew the work from Pietro d'Or Cortona, a painting uh, behind you all that I'm looking at right there. Uh, Mattia Preti, a painting to your left, 
uh, Herod, realizing his, uh, his, the results of his actions in the beheading of John the Baptist. And this artist was also aware of Rubens and Poussin, two examples in this gallery as well. Luca Giordano was extremely prolific. His nickname was Luca fa presto, Luca works fast, or Luca the fast worker. He was very sought after in his own uh, career. He had commissions from the Medici court in Italy, uh, he, and he served the Spanish king in Madrid, Charles II, from 1692 until his return to Naples uh, some years prior to Giordano's death in 1705. Now, we do not have any commission. We don't know who, why Giordano created this painting. Given its scale, given the uh, degree of work on it, it had to have been a commission, and that means by the Roman Catholic Church. Its ambition and scale certainly suggest it may have been an altarpiece. We think of altarpieces generally in a vertical upright position, but it's not uh, out of the bounds of plausibility that this too assumed that role. On stylistic grounds, jargon for art historians thinking they know what they're talking about, we can date this picture to the early 1660s. And hence, has been noted by another art historian, Giordano painted the liberation of St. Peter in the years of celebration and thanksgiving following the end of a plague that had devastated Naples and concluded in 1656. So within five to eight years after that, this painting comes into existence. And it's not unlikely that the subject of St. Peter's freeing from prison for its Neapolitan 1660s audience uh, had an immense symbolic and metaphoric power. Uh, the story doubtless engendered associations with the sudden call to God, the freeing from darkness of this world and from the bonds of sin, the power of prayer, which you'll hear is cited uh, right in the passage when Bishop Thomas reads it shortly and perhaps first and foremost, the theme of deliverance. I'm a strong believer old master paintings are relevant to us today. The parallel I would ask us all to contemplate is, uh, remember, a painting right after a plague that decimated a, an enormous population, segment of the population of Naples. Think of what was transpiring in our country and elsewhere in the world uh, beginning in the late uh, 1970s, the AIDS epidemic, which engendered a great deal of artistic response. And doubtless, there will be forthcoming responses to the current calamity of the Ebola outbreak. If we don't know for certain the orig original location of the painting that the museum introduces this evening, let me raise what is known about the provenance, the past ownership then, of the picture. It was acquired somehow by a member of an English family, the Mackenzies, probably during the second half of the 19th century. And the picture hung in their estate, Folly Court, in Buckinghamshire, which had been in the possession of the Mackenzie family since 1853. I cannot resist the following. As an arcane but fascinating aside, for those enthusi enthusiasts and devotees of Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows, written in 1908, and I read it to my daughter, Margaret, who's in this very room. The inspiration for Toad Hall is reputed to have been the very castle where the painting hung for over a century. It descended at the painting, as did that castle for that matter, with the family until the painting came on re recently came onto the market. And our consideration of this painting commenced in March of 2012 when Brian Kennedy and I were at the European Fine Arts Fair in Maastricht, the Netherlands, and we spotted this picture, as did all fair goers, uh, 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 diligent ones, uh, at, on the stand of a London dealer, Patrick Matisson, as, as has been reported uh, in the press. I saw this picture again in a very cold London warehouse in January of 2013, and subsequently, um, studied other paintings by Giordano in museums and churches from Bergamo, London, Canberra, where I've not been, but a painting that Brian Kennedy had the National Gallery of Australia acquire there, hung in the Philadelphia Museum of Art when I 
I was working there from 86 to 92. I also studied pictures by Giordano in Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, New York, Richmond, Sarasota, and Williamsburg. I has also looked at my notes closely from an experience in Naples in 2010. So this is the process that's ongoing of how purchase considerations play out. As Brian's alluded to, we conducted a great deal of contact with colleagues and specialists of Luca Giordano. We made market comparisons of the past and present. And then in July of this year, we had the picture come to Toledo for purchase consideration further. I remember the day because it was Bastille Day. My colleagues, the art handlers, installed this picture. And Brian and I and others continued to assess it. Uh, we brought in uh, con conservators, pa uh, painting conservators, and our own uh, object conservator, Suzanne Hargrove. We all assessed it and, and were verified that the condition of the canvas and the paint layer is superb. And so in uh, the early autumn, Brian presents the painting to the Board of Trustees Art Committee. Negoti approval ensued. Uh, then, uh, often in a good cop, bad cop way, the director engages on the good cop, Brian positions himself. Otherwise, it works. Um, we communicated with the dealer and, and ended up with an agreed upon negotiated situation and the acquisition was Toledo's. <laughs> Since we've taken ownership of it, uh, we have revarnished the painting. Varnish is uh, a protective coat put on an oil painting uh, to uh, preserve the, the paint layer underneath, to also provide uh, saturation for colors, uh, varnishes that discolor over time, and that means decades, if not centuries. Can uh, the, Luke, the Guido Reni is the next picture in this room to get a cleaning. Uh, that image of Venus over there needs, she needs to be uh, restored. We're getting there. So in this instance, all we have to do is put a brighter, a newer varnish on it. So many of you are interested in, in frames. I sure am. This is a 17th century frame. Whether it's Portuguese or Spanish, we're not sure, but it is certainly appropriate for the picture. In conclusion, I was certain my fellow Toledo curators who were of great assistance in this acquisition were certain, and the director was certain that this acquisition would be a superlative one. But we are all the more happy to bear witness to recent praise for it from professional colleagues. Brian's alluded to the visit earlier this week of the head of the chairman of the painting department and of the Metropolitan, Keith Christensen. He knew of the painting and was very happy to see it in this institution and loves it. Giuseppe Scavizzi, the author of the monograph, the catalog raisonné of, of uh, Luca Giordano, wrote just in the last week and a half, and I quote, because I'm very proud of this quote, I am glad that the painting went to a public collection and I'm particularly glad that it went to such an important institution as the Toledo Museum. It is, in my view, the best painting by Giordano in an American museum. The Tribune de l'Art, a French blog, wrote, writes of it as authentique chef d'oeuvre, an authentic masterpiece. Luca Giordano's The Liberation of St. Peter is a veritable cracker of a painting, as Brian likes to refer to it. <laughs> Methinks the Toledo Museum of Art's visionary founder, Edward Drummond Libby, would be utterly proud of our new addition to the collection, a work that doubtless will be appreciated by our Toledo community. My thanks for your attention.